Um, Lord Jesus, uh, we welcome the Holy Spirit here this morning, mm-hmm. Father God. Yes. Lord, we come expecting um, a visitation from you, Lord God. And Father God, I pray, mm-hmm. Father God, uh, for these men, Lord God. I, again, we're just so grateful that they're here, Lord God. I mean, we thank you for the work that you're doing in their lives and are continuing to do. And so, Father God, we give this morning service over to you and, and use them mightily, Father God. Um, Father, help us this to be a mutual thing. Uh, we will be a blessing to them, but they certainly will be a blessing to us. And it is in Jesus' name Lord we pray. Jesus, we feel your presence here today. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord Jesus, because you live, we live. So without further ado, um, we're going to let the Lord Jesus work through these vessels, through these men this morning. So Brother Hector. Good morning, church. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, For those of you who don't know, Adult and Teen Challenge is a 12 to 15 month program uh, giving hope to those and drug addicts and families. Uh, It was founded by a small town Pennsylvania pastor named David Wilkerson in the Bronx. Due to his faithful obedience, we are now the most successful and biggest program of its kind. We have 11 centers in New England, uh, 230 nationwide, and 1,400 and 125 nations. Uh, Today you'll be hearing testimonies from men who have had their lives changed, walking through hope and Jesus Christ. At this time, I would like to introduce the men of Adult and Teen Challenge. Hello, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, oldest of four, came from a pretty good family. Uh, that was until a week before my 10th birthday. My mother asked me to go wake up my father, and he did not wake up. So me being the oldest, I tried to be the strongest I could. I didn't make it long until I started drinking, which was at age 11. And most people didn't like their first sip, but I did. Uh, I actually loved it, to be honest. Um, I did that for a long time. I I, I drank for 20 years, uh, a long time. I also did a lot of drugs. I got introduced to uh, marijuana when I was 13. 14 came cocaine. Um, I was brilliant in high school. I uh, starred in tennis, got a full scholarship to Texas A&M for tennis, but I did not take it because drinking ruined that. So instead, I decided to join the military. I wanted to go Navy, but instead I went Army, Uh, did four years active and six years reserve. I would have stayed active, but due to women and alcohol, I decided to come back to reality or what I thought was reality. Uh, In the military, my drinking kicked up quite a bit. For anybody that served, you know drinking is huge in the military, and you have easier access to drugs than you do out here. Uh, So I deployed in 2012, got introduced to opium in Afghanistan, and that's where my drugs and drinking really took off. I uh, went reserves in 2016 because I had a, 2014, sorry, because I had a daughter and my wife wanted me to stay closer so we could raise a family. That unfortunately did not help. I started drinking more because I didn't have stability, was in and out of work, uh, couldn't find something that I enjoyed doing after the military, and the reserves wasn't cutting it, but I didn't feel I could go back to active. So long story short, I ended up having more kids. I've lost four on the way, uh, but I did just have a child in October who I have not met, but I am here. This is my second stint in Adult and Teen Challenge. First time I was here, I had a negative attitude. 
wasn't here for the right reasons and just wanted people off my back. Uh, so I came in, was here for 47 days, was the longest at that time that I have been sober since I was 14. But I ended up leaving with a buddy of mine because he, I'm very impulsive, I make impulsive decisions and I think I know what is better. At the time I, I did. Uh, so I left and got introduced to heroin. I got shot up while I was drunk. Uh, my buddy, who I thought was my buddy, shot me up while I was hammered, and I ended up ODing four times in five days. My wife called, pretty much told me it was me doing drugs or the children and her. So I told her to come pick me up. I didn't know we were coming back to Team Challenge, but when I came to, after my high and drunkenness, we were back at the doors of Teen Challenge. And honestly, I'm, I'm happy I'm back. My wife took my kid anyway, but I, I, I'm grateful for that. It, it's allowing me to grow through myself, become a better person through God. And because of that, I'll be able to become a better father. I'm now, I just made, I'm on my fifth month sober. So this is now the longest I've made. Uh, it wouldn't. I wouldn't have that without the brothers here, but most of all, it's, it's, it's God. He's, he's really opened my eyes to a lot of things now, and I, if, if I keep on this path, I know I'll get my kids back. I'll meet the one that was born in October, but I can no longer do this on my own, and I've realized that. So due to his glory and the brothers here that have helped me along the way, and Hector as well, I, I look at him as a father figure now that I don't have any. So it's really helped me a lot. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the service. Well done. Good morning. So uh, we come out here, we share our testimonies, but we really don't tell you what goes on in a day of the life of a, a resident in Teen Challenge. So I got a PowerPoint for you. Uh, so you know, we wake up in the morning, usually uh, 6 o'clock, could be earlier, depends on the day. Um, we have 25 minutes to get downstairs for breakfast. Everything's five minutes early to everything, because if not, you're late, and you get used to that really quick. Um, so we have our breakfast. After that, we do prayer. Um, we also have chores that we do after every meal. Um, then we close the day out with prayer uh, right after dinner. And then we have some free time towards the end of the day. Um, we also do our chapel on Tuesday. Um, and then Wednesday through Saturday, we do outreach. And then Sunday, we, had a, we do church service. And lucky for you, we're here today. Next one. Our academics, um, we have a lot that we do down there. We do um, scripture memorizations. We do Bible readings, which is we get a, a book in the Bible, and we do a page of notes per chapter that we, that we go through. Um, we have the character qualities, um, which is there's a lot of deep-rooted issues after we get rid of the drugs. So we get to do a self-inventory on ourselves and really get down to what's causing us to do those drugs and alcohol. We also have the group studies and five-minute message. The five-minute message is where we take a scripture. We are right to cross-references, you know, what God's saying in, to us in that. And then on the back, we do a, a page-long message of how we can apply it to our life and uh, kind of reflect on our life and, you know, let other people know. We also share it as well and see, uh, you know, what we would have done differently if we, we knew about this. The outreach, the left-hand side, is the EPIC team. It stands for Education, Prevention, Intervention, Connection. This is where we go out to local uh, school districts. And we get to share uh, to the kids, you know, the, the path that we took and let them know they don't have to go down to the same path. Uh, the best way to prevent drug addiction is stopping it, you know, firsthand. Uh, the right side is the uh, end addiction team. This is where you'll see us in front of convenience stores or local markets. Um, it's a good time for us to really just spread the word of God, you know, let, them, let people know what he's doing in our life and really just raise money for the ministry. Maybe come in contact with someone who needs the help and give them, a, you know, a car to direct them in the right, right area to get into the program as well. Uh, the Fall Banquet, this is at the Manchester Doubletree. Um, this is a good way for us to, to support our sponsors as well. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of alumni speakers, guest speakers, um, graduates. Um, Hector as well does something there. Um, it is open to the public. Um, so if you'd like to attend, you can come see, you know, me or Hector, and we can get, get you some con in contact so uh, you can get a table there and uh, really see what God's doing in all of our lives. Uh, the golf tournament, this is in August. Um, golf is definitely not my sport. Um, so, you know, you may get paired up with one of us. I don't know if anyone plays golf, but you'll find out real quick if we know how. Um, it's really a good time just to kind of relax and, and support our sponsors. You know, uh, they do a lot for us, so it's a way for us to really 
you know, have fun in the day in the sun. We, we have um, some raffles. We do a, a catered meal as well. Um, so if any of you do golf, uh, we'd like for you to join us. Uh, the Ride for Freedom. Uh, this is taking place at the Manchester um, Harley-Davidson. Uh, we do an hour-long ride there. We do a lot of raffles. We have a barbecue. There's a live band. So it's really a good time to come out and see what God's doing in our lives. Um, as well, if you have a bike, definitely come join us for the ride. Uh, it's escorted by the police, and it's a, it's a great time, really, just to, to fellowship with one another. Oh, the gift wrapping. So we, we got done this. Um, it was the 1st of January, and it's exactly what it looks like. Um, they hand us a pair of scissors, and they say you're going to go wrap gifts, and if you don't know how to do it, you're going to learn real quick. And it really, this was, I got to experience this, and not going to lie, I am professional at gift wrapping, um, but this was probably the funnest time I've had. Um, you know, Christmas can be a dark time for some people, uh, especially if it's the first time going through, you know, without a loved one. Uh, they come up thinking we're the Macy's team, then they find out Macy's doesn't even wrap gifts, and then they're starting to ask us about our story, and we get to, you know, share the love of Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, before you know it, they're bringing all their gifts there. They want to support the ministry. And next thing you know, you know, they're going to church or something like that. So it's really a great time just to, you know, spread the love. Uh, Camperia. Um, so this is, we get three days um, on Newfound Lake. We actually are with the main center um, when we go here. So it's three days for us just to kind of relax. We have great worship. We do a lot of prayer. Uh, we meet our fellow brothers from Maine as well and get to, you know, share what God's doing in our lives. Um, we, it is very busy in Adult and Teen Challenge, so it's a way for us to kind of relax a little bit and just worship, worship God. Camp Champion is about the same as Camp Aria, except it's a larger scale. We have all 11 centers in New England get together in upstate New York. So um, same thing, we get to swim, a lot of baptisms going on. Um, definitely great worship and prayer. So you got about 400 people praising God, and uh, really coming from the same uh, the same aspect of life. So we get to you know meet our fellow brothers and sisters as well. So it's a, it's a great time. I'm very I'm looking forward to it. So keep us in prayers because we haven't been able to do it because of COVID. Family restoration it's definitely one of the most important uh, parts of the program besides your relationship with the Lord. Uh, we come into here and we're we're completely broken. We don't really understand what we did to our families. Um, so we have this in the second Sunday of each month, and it gives a godly environment for us to sit down and have those conversations that we were completely avoiding. Um, and, you know, I'm nine months in the program now, so they're getting, they're definitely better for me uh, than, you know, the first time I got in there, she, she roasted me. Um, and I was trying to avoid that, that conversation the whole time. But it's, it gives a chance for our families to heal as well as ourselves. Uh, you know, after like, you know, four or five of them, they actually have, uh, they have some hope you know, and see the change. And then, you know, by the ninth or 10th one, they're, they're excited for you to come home. So it's really a time to get everything out on the table and really sort through the, the healing process. Uh, the graduation, you may think this is the end, but really this is just the beginning for us. Um, so, you, you know, this is really a, a great time. We actually have one coming up uh, Friday. And uh, Aaron Scheel is now graduating on Friday. So it, it's definitely going to be a great time, and I know he, he thinks the same. It's definitely an emotional time uh, from all the hard work we put in and to really uh, reflect on our life of where we came from and where we are now. Uh, it is open to the public. It's at, at our uh, Brockton facility in Mass. So um, if you would like, definitely come down and check it out. Um, but, you know, what separates you know, this program from others is obviously we have Jesus Christ, but uh, we have a lot of aftercare. We have a uh, 6 months apprenticeship that, that you can do. Um, we also have a staff house, which you can live up to a year with the accountability. Um, you know, they make sure you have your driver's license. They do life planning. They do counseling, anger management. So uh, they really set you up, you know, for success in your, in your life. We also make sure you, you can do some resumes if you don't want to do the apprenticeship. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just glad to be up here and be able to come out here and share what, what the Lord's doing in all of our lives because I wouldn't be up here. So I uh, thank you all and God bless. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gene. Um, as you were writing, uh, we were handing out these prayer cards. We'd really love to have uh, each and every one of you fill it out. If you didn't receive one or a pen and you need one, please raise your hand and one of my brothers will give you one as soon as possible. Um, on the left-hand side is where you put your basic information. 
this allows us to keep in contact with you about our um, events that you were saw on the PowerPoint, and it also gives you uh, a newsletter on the joy and celebration of a changed life. I not myself or um, changed life by my brother. Um, on the right hand side is where you put your prayer. Um, this is the most important part. Um, every you know everybody needs a prayer for something, whether it's a struggling loved one, um, finances, health, the job, but. Um, here in Teen Challenge, we have intercessory prayer where we um, pray for your card twice a day. Um, there's no, like I said, no prayer too big or too small for God. You know, we value your prayers as well as ourselves. Um, and if you please uh, fill it out, get back to the back of the table at the end of the service. We pretty gladly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, back again. Uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, my name is, is Jordan, Jordan Michael. You can just kind of sit on that for a little bit. Um, I'm from Salisbury, New Hampshire. Uh, actually, you probably have heard of it because we kind of go by it on the way here. Um, so I grew up in a, a close and loving family, had mostly what I want growing up. Uh, I played a lot of sports. You know, my family was, was really nice. They gave me everything I ever wanted. Um, by the age of 10, uh, my mom was sick a lot or what I thought she was sick. She was in bed a lot, and it kind of irritated my dad. Um, it wasn't a year later until I found out really what was going on in my house. I went into her purse to get some uh, lunch money, and I didn't find any lunch money. All I found were syringes and a bunch of pills at the bottom. Um, so a year later after that, they, they split up, got divorced. Um, I'm the oldest of three, and my dad was working third shift. Uh, so it left me with a lot of responsibilities at a young age. I was getting my, my siblings up to, for school, making sure they got on the bus, got back home, made sure they did their homework, fed them, and at the same time, I was trying to manage myself at a young age. Um, by the time I got into high school, I was uh, smoking weed, I was drinking, I had the house to myself a lot. My dad had just met a, a woman and was gone for weeks on end, so at the age of 14, 15, I was having parties on Monday nights with multiple people, and it's definitely not something you should be doing as a, as a high school student. Uh, this progressed all through high school. Um, you know, my spot was kind of the place to where where everybody was getting enabled by my house. Um, so you know, that definitely did it did a role on me as well. Um, you know, by the time I was at the end of high school, I was mixing Xanax and cocaine in the mix with all that. By the grace of God, I did graduate. Uh, after I graduated, um, a couple of years later, I had a son um, at the age of 21. And again, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, me and the, the mother split up after a couple months after he was born, so uh, I had 50-50 custody, and I was taking care of my son as a single father and not even have any clue of what I was doing at the time. Um, so that put a lot, a lot of stress on me. Uh, I was racing motocross, so I injured myself a lot. Um, the, the doctors, because I was so young, I mean, I'd get cortisone shots and everything in the spine, but they wouldn't give me anything for pain, so I was just kind of self-medicating. Um, I was doing Percocets. I was getting them from my father. I wasn't paying for them. Um, so I really didn't think about the outcome it have on my life. I figured my dad was doing it. It'd be okay for me to do it. So, um, you know, at the time of needing a father, I kind of just got a friend. Um, and that, that escalated a, a lot. Um, you know, a couple years after that, we lost the house that I grew up in my whole entire life. Uh, so I was thrown into an environment again that I had no idea what I was doing. I moved in with a friend. Uh, to try and save money. And as you can imagine, you know, this is why I'm here, I didn't save any money at all. Um, you know, I, I couldn't get the Percocets, and that's when I was introduced to heroin for the first time. Uh, two years goes by, you know, of doing it every single day. Uh, I was, I ended up being homeless. I was sleeping at the Concord bus station. I was working a full-time job to really support my habit and to be homeless. So uh, every, everything revolved around the drug. It was like I, I was possessed. It consumed every thought. You know, my life didn't matter. My son's life didn't matter. Um, I didn't look at my dad as a dad. It was just kind of a, a drug dealer and a, really just a, a friend at the time. I went to a detox for about a week. Um, then I went, went stayed with my, my actual friend for two weeks. And then I went to Florida. Um, for a couple weeks as well. And then I, ca I came back, I stayed what I thought was sober for 16 months, but really I just wasn't doing heroin. I was doing everything else, but in, in my own head, I was telling myself I was doing good. Um, and when I couldn't see my son again, I went back to whatever gave me that false hope and that false comfort. 
Um, so I got into heroin again. And as you can imagine, Sam, I'm in the same exact position. Two years go by, I'm completely homeless. I'm making $1,500 a week to be homeless, staying in motels here and there. Um, I was in a motel one night, and, you know, I was just, I hit the end of myself. I really needed something, and I really wanted it. Um, so I called about 14 detox centers, and every single one had a two-week waiting list. And I knew I needed it now. I didn't know if I had two weeks left in my life. Um, so my, my cousin, funny story, went to go buy a bed on Facebook Marketplace, and uh, the guy actually had one of our bracelets, the end addiction bracelets, and he's a pastor in Concord. And um, the next day I heard about Teen Challenge. I called him up, and I came in the doors within 50 minutes later after hearing about it. And uh, I, I came in, and instantly people are laughing, smiling, and first thing I think, I'm like, these people are faking it. There's absolutely no way that these people are this happy. I'm like, I, I don't even want to be here. You know, but it, having that drug addict mentality, I wanted what they had. I didn't care what it took. That's exactly what I was looking for. The atmosphere was completely different. Um, you know, I, got, I was doing a, a, lo a lot of heroin, and I should definitely have been sick for a long time. But, you know, I gave my life to Christ, and, you know, in prayer, God delivered me from everything. It was like I never did a drug my whole entire life. Amen. Praise God. Um, you know, I got introduced to the gospel, the prayer. Um, actually, by the power of prayer, my dad went into Maine Teen Challenge a month after I did. So he's also in Maine now. Yeah. I got to experience that at Camperia when me and him were doing drugs together. Now we're able to go to the altar together. So it, it was awesome, man. It was awesome. Um, you know, and since coming in here, God's not only told me, like, taught me how to love myself, but also to love others, which I never thought I'd be able to do. I didn't love myself for, or anything I ever did. But now to be able to care for others above myself is truly a blessing to be able to do. Um, I've hit, I have nine months next week, and uh, my plan is to stay on and do the apprenticeship and do the program development and really just to pour into my other brothers because, uh, you know, that's my new addiction is helping others. So um, it feels good. Um, you know, I don't know what God has for me after that, but I fully trust in him. And, um, you know, it feels good. it's a lot easier to trust in him than trying to trust in myself because I never could. Um, and, you know, the, um, the scripture I stand on right now is James 21 and 22. It says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Amen. And, yeah, amen. Um, and so when I came in here, I, was, I had no money, as you can imagine. Um, but, but they took me right in. Like I said, within an hour and a half, they had a bed waiting. They had, they had food, clothes, everything I ever needed. Um, you know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we don't accept any, any government or state assistance, only food stamps. Uh, we would be able to, to accept the assistance if we took Jesus Christ out of the equation. And we're, we're not willing to do that at all. Because um, we know that's the true, true way to freedom. So, um, you know, being the body of believers, we are asking for your help. We have a lot of ways to the support the ministry. Uh, we have great cutting boards that are handmade by our residents as well as part of their recovery process. Uh, we got a lot of products like coffee and shirts. Um, we actually have some shirts we'd like to give some people, so if you'd come and see us. Um, we have some, some select few that we are, we are looking to give away, the epic ones, just a way to give back to you guys. Um, but best of all that you can support the ministry is by a resident sponsorship. It's a dollar a day, $30 a month. Um, you can do one, one resident, two, whatever's on your heart. Uh, we do have a gift. It's a, a Christian classics book. It's got three stories in it. Um, so if you do feel the tug on your heart, um, please see me in the back table, and I'd love to get you signed up. Um, so thank you all, and God bless you all. Praise the Lord for these testimonies of God's grace and mercy. Amen. Never gets old. I love this, the songs we sang. Uh, one of them, the first one, or second one might have been uh, that verse about building on the rock of Christ. I love that. Uh, that should be our focus all the time. My name is Hector, and I'm the associate director of Adult and Teen Challenge New Hampshire. And much like my brothers, I'm not going to do the full story, but you know, it's, it's really no different than anyone else's. I made a mess of my life. Really, my life was always a mess. Uh, my childhood was, was very dysfunctional, very chaotic, full of drugs, alcohol, crime, chaos, violence, you name it. 
And that's really the only thing I ever knew. So, you know, my stepfather was very abusive. Uh, I mean, I just remember getting beat all the time. My self-esteem was non-existent, and I didn't know who I was. And I didn't expect a whole lot from my life. And so when he passed away, I was just shy of my 15th birthday. You know, I built on that life. That's what I built the rest of my life on, what I had, the foundation I had from childhood, which wasn't great. You can imagine where that took me, the places it took me, the things that I did, and how much more I lost myself along the way. I spent 25 years uh, running and gunning hard. I'm a very aggressive person, so everything I do, I do to the utmost, which pays dividends now in serving Christ. But in those days, it took me to the end of my rope and then some. And in March of 2014, I was, I was done. And, you know, just really no way out, can't stop, want to stop, losing my family, restraining orders out of the house, sleeping on my mother's couch, broken, busted, disgusted, helpless, hopeless, miserable, shame, guilt-ridden, didn't look myself in the mirror, never looked at my wife and kids in the face, just the shame was, was unbearable. And I can't describe to you in words just how bottom low, you know, how low I was and out of options I was, but God. And that's where, that's where I met God, in that lowly place. I, I you know, heard about Teen Challenge. I made a phone call. A couple weeks later, I came in, and on March 14th, 2014, the first day that I got there, I surrendered my life to the Lord, and I've never been the same. He just radically delivered me from my mess that I was in for my whole life, just shy of my 40th birthday, uh, just a total deliverance. I, I'm not talking about this wishy, wishy-wash or, you know, maybe relapsing or st- struggling with the idea of going back. I'm talking absolute and total deliverance when I cried out to him. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's the God we serve. I, it doesn't have to be any other way. When your heart is ready, he knows it, and he pulls you right out of that mess. And so it was time to learn how to build on a new foundation. And real quick, Pastor Kevin, I love you. I'm sorry you're not here. I do have a gift for you, one of our handmade cutting boards. Um, Just to say we love you, we appreciate you, we appreciate the church and your support for so many years. And so we'll make sure that that gets in your hands. But I had to learn to build on a new foundation, which I had no idea how to do. So I'm at... I'm one day saved. It's March 15th, 2014. It's my first full day at what was then Teen Challenge, is now Adult and Teen Challenge. And, you know, this thing happens that all my brothers can relate to. It's like all you're doing is destruction, right? But you can't kind of, because you numb yourself with the next high or the next drink or the next whatever, you don't really feel it all the time. You're not really emotionally there. You're numb all the time. When you come into Teen Challenge and your family drops you off at the door and you say goodbye and some time passes, some hours, there's this feeling. Now, for some, it's a week or or maybe a a day, a month. But for me, it was kind of like that first day was great, gave my life to the Lord and all that. But the next day, I was like, how's this going to work? How am I going to be here for 15 months? How's my wife going to survive with the kids? You know, I started thinking of all these worries, man, all these things, and they really, now, I didn't know anything. I was a baby, you know, just, I was just born in Christianity the day before, so I didn't have a whole lot to to build on, but I know I was sitting in the academic center, and I was reading the Bible, waiting for the academics coordinator to hand me my syllabus so I could get started on some work, and I don't know how, but I do know how. The Holy Spirit had me in Matthew chapter 6, which is where we're going to go today. Matthew 6, and we'll start at verse 24. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have today to worship you freely, for chains to be broken, to live a life that is good, that is Christ-centered, that is full of servitude and love and peace, and joy. We're so grateful for your presence. We're so grateful for the ministry of Teen Challenge. 
We're so grateful for your redeeming power and your saving grace. And we're so thankful for your word that ministers, guides, and leads us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that only you can do. And we ask you to have your way during these next few minutes as we touch on your word and share. Would you minister to us? Would you poke? Would you prod? Would you turn things up? Would you lead? Would you guide? Would you have your way? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm, I'm, again, I'm like sitting there at the table, not saying anything to anybody, but just going like, I don't know about this. And this is what I read. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Or mammon, King James Version, I like that. Mammon, money, possessions, valuables, whatever it is that you consider most valuable. It wasn't really money my mind was on. It was the worries. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See, for me, it was so ironic because I was thinking that. School's going to, you know, how's she going to get clothes? How's all this going to work? Now, mind you, I wasn't helping anyway. <laughs> but, but I was living in a, in a fantasy land in my head. I didn't realize how bad things were. I wasn't really contributing to the household anyway. But the worry and the panic and the fear inside of me was real. Don't worry about clothes. See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? That made sense to me in my limited understanding at the time. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I just kind of went, hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. Looking back, I'm like, man, I, the Lord spoke to me that day. The Holy Spirit ministered to my heart. I didn't know it then. I could have never put that into words at the time. But I can tell you that I had a peace and that I stopped and I prayed and I just surrendered my family in the, that moment. Just me and him. Most of those things that happened in the beginning wasn't somebody around me. For me, this is my story. It was, wasn't really somebody taking me by the hand. It was just me and the Lord a lot. Of, like when I got saved, I was in a corner crying, bawling. It was the first day I got to Teen Challenge. I was a wreck, and it was like a screenshot in my head. <laughs> failure, failure, brokenness, brokenness, pain, all the misery and pain that I went through and that I caused everybody else. Just all this stuff happened, and I said, God, I'll do whatever you want. Please help me. In my heart, I was begging him, please help me. I don't even know what else to do anymore. I give up. I'll do anything you want. Later, I realized, wow, I got saved in that moment. That's pretty cool. Just me and him. Next day, same thing. Just me and him. Just me and the Lord. And he ministered to me out of this. And I knew I needed to trust God. I knew I needed to build a new foundation. Build on a new foundation. See, the... the way Jesus says no one can serve two masters, it's not a suggestion. It's not like Jesus is suggesting this. It's a fact that he's stating. We can't. We can't serve two. It's not even possible. Because why? It says what? It says, we'll either be, where did it go? Of course I lost it. 
it says, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't split your, you can't give your heart to two different directions. You just can't do it. I didn't, you know, and I had to learn that. I, I now know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost eight years from that day. Seven years almost serving in ministry after graduating. And I've learned so much about that since then. I've been tested in that so many times. We're conditioned to worry in this world. Society programs us and conditions us to worry and to look out for number one, which they think is yourself. Everything you see on TV, everything you hear on the radio, scroll across Facebook. I don't care if it's buy a home, get the next car, the newest phone, the next this, your kids got to have that, your college tuition, your 401k. The thing is chasing riches, no matter, and a lot of times the enemy is crafty because in our heads we will we will see it differently. We won't say we're chasing riches. Most people would not say that. Would not say, well, it's not that. You know, I just got to make sure my kid's taken care of. I just got to make sure everything is straight. That's not what this scripture talks about. This scripture talks about forget about all that. Focus on Jesus. Focus on kingdom work. Focus on the king of kings and let him take care of all that. See, there's a, there's a difficulty in that big time because we need to surrender everything about us in order to do that. And I, I had to learn. I didn't know that day, but I know now he had to teach me this stuff early because he had a plan to use me. He had a plan to use me in ministry. He had a plan to use me in kingdom work, and that was not going to be an easy road. That was going to require a lot of sacrifice, a lot of surrender. I was going to hit a lot of walls. There was going to be a ton of obstacles. I was going to be challenged in every way to split my heart two ways and to try to serve two masters. And I'm sure that you could relate. Who can't, right? See, only a few verses earlier in verse 21, Jesus says, For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. So what do you treasure today, church? What do we treasure, my brothers? When we're a resident in the program, if you're like me, see, that's what, I, what was happening. I was treasuring my family. Again, society says, well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Put your family first. I was treasuring the security of my family. That was what was shaking me up. No. We need to treasure, put all our treasures in him. He, he should be what we treasure. It's out of that and out of that relationship and out of that kingdom work that flows everything that we need and all the blessings that he has for us and for our family. Yeah. Yeah. 25, so says, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Uh, don't be anxious, another version says. Don't be anxious. I, I was anxious in that moment. I'm sure that some of you could have had many moments in your life where you're anxious. See, I had to just let go and say, I don't know how it's going to work out, but God, I'm going to choose to trust you. I don't know how she's going to make it. I don't know what she's going to do with it when the car doesn't make it. I don't know how she's going to come visit all the time. I don't know how she's going to pay the bills. She has a medical condition that most people don't know of. In those days, it was a little, more, it was a little worse. So it wasn't long before that that she was in the hospital. I was like, oh, what happens if that happens again? Oh, man, how's that going to work? Worry disables. It doesn't enable. You know what I'm saying? There's no empowering in worry. There's nothing. It's, don't, Jesus said you can't add a single day or you can't add a single cubit to your stature. It's not going to change anything. Ruth Graham Bell, Billy Graham's wife, said, I have learned that worship and worry can't live in the same heart. They are mutually exclusive. Perfect. Sums it right up. I 
I challenge everyone today in that. See, I meet a lot of people that come through the program, and I see a lot of people that have a call on their life, and I, and I can recognize it. We can recognize it as, as ministers of the gospel, the ambassadors for the Ministry of Teen Challenge, as people who have been there. You know what I mean? You can just see it. You just know when somebody's supposed to serve the Lord, whether it's in the Ministry of Teen Challenge or not. I keep saying Teen Challenge, adult and Teen Challenge or not. You know when somebody has a call. And you know what happens a lot of the times, more times than I really hate to say, is they go in a different direction. Because the worries, the cares. I've, I've sat down with more people over the last seven years as a staff member. I've had more conversations with people that have a call that are, that are like, well, I got this opportunity and you know, this, will, this pays really well. It's close to home. Everything will work out. Close to home. Has the insurance. will take care of the kids. And, and it's, it's, uh, they're wrestling. Why, why are they wrestling? Because they know there's something inside of them pulling them in a different direction. But there's no, you can't see in that direction. The Lord will reveal to you what he wants to reveal to you when he wants to reveal it. Psalm 119, 105 says, a lamp stand, uh, the, your word is a lamp stand to my feet, a light into my path. I always tell people that. I picture it. As soon as I hear that scripture, I picture an old lantern. I should, old lantern. When you have a, a lantern or something like that, it's not like this shining light. You can only see a little bit. So when you're walking with the Lord, that's how you walk. Where now, Lord? The rest is dark. So that's scary, it's uncertain, makes it rattles us, but it increases our faith in Jesus Christ if we walk like that. I love walking that way now. I love it. I don't think it's so much that some of these brothers that I'm talking about, I don't think it's so much that they didn't trust God, and maybe for some of us today, we we're in a place where, you know, that's not the case either, and that, that's kind of more of why we wrestle too, because well, it's not like I don't trust God, and we and few people would ever admit this, but it's not that these it's not that we don't trust God to clothe us. That this word says He'll clothe us and all those things. We trust that. It's just kind of like, how is He going to clothe us? Meaning, like, is it going to be what I want? Mm. That's the real deal. If we could get real with ourselves, we'll say, mm. see, I, I, my first salary when I started, I didn't even know how much I was going to make. The Lord spoke to me clearly out of uh, 2 Samuel 16, boom, like a rocket, just spoke to my heart when I was on my bunk, when I was seven, six, seven months in the, in the program, and I knew right there. The next phone call I made to Carmen, I said, I got I to gotta stay. I was like a burning desire. I got, I'm supposed to stay here after. I, I, I'm so glad for my ignorance. <laughs> I didn't worry about I'm so glad that that happened in day one, bec- in that first day, because by the time I got to five, six, seven months, I'd battled a lot, and I had, I had, like, had some pretty good faith for a young baby a Christian. So in the, I just knew this, what I felt, burning desire in my heart. I didn't know how, what, when, what, how, how's that going to work? Okay, we had four, we got a blended family, four kids, one of them's my daughter who was with her mother, but I had custody. DCF was involved on both ends. That was a mess. We had two older kids that that's all they knew. My wife had never lived anywhere different. She was a worry wart. She wasn't even saved. We had no money to move. It was an hour away. We never lived in New Hampshire. No idea how much I was going to make. Just said, yes, God. Yes, God. And let me tell you, that feeling inside the heart, woo, nothing better. So when the time came, the Lord just put it together. I, I could, it's, it's too long of a story, but, you know, everything got figured out, needless to say, because he's in control. And everything we consider to be a problem is nothing but an opportunity for him if our eyes are on him. So he put it all together for me, and my salary was half of what I had made 20 years prior. 20 years prior, I made double, and it wasn't a, like I was making a ton of money at that time. What am I saying? I'm saying the Lord taught me how, started to begin to, 
continued to teach me out of the scripture how I was going to not just know this and surrender my family when I got saved and go through teen challenges. That's just one thing. Now you're going to live this thing. Now you're going to walk it out. You're going to serve me with your whole heart. You're going to trust me for every single thing. I'll show you what I want to show you when I want to show you. Just trust me. I'm so glad I didn't know what was going to come because <laughs> it was scary and it was challenging. And, you know, we, we, I went back to the scripture again and again. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many times I sat doing my finances and almost cried. See, society also tells you, be the man, take care of your family. But the way that society conditions us to do that is in riches, in mammon, in money. And we're so programmed that even though I knew it wasn't that, I still wrestled with it because the truck would break down. I couldn't figure out how it was all going to work. My kids would be going to school. You know, kids want nice stuff. I'm high maintenance. Shoot, forget about the kids. I like $100 kicks. You know what I mean? I like nice stuff. So we just, and there's nothing worse for me in my background and what, the way I grew up and what's in my heart. There was nothing worse for me than to see my wife or my kids in need and me not say, I got this. Oh, boy, nothing humbled me more than that. But you know what? I, the Lord taught my family through my surrender to him, to my dependence on him, to what we considered at the time to be our lack was our blessing, and the Lord taught my family as he taught me that. What, how could you get that in money? Matter of fact, you'd miss that if we had what we think we need. Oh, hallelujah, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the hard road. He would say, seek first. God, how am I going to... You know, I, I would, I'd get caught up. There'd be moments, which I'm sure you could relate, where I'd be consumed with the financial situation. There were times where it was, in, it was just too much. You know, you know, I'd go like, all right, I trust you, but this is crazy. There's no way out. Like, this makes no sense. I'm serving you. I've given you my life. I, you know, how many conversations I had with God? Like, you know, I've done all this stuff, God. I've been serving you the last few years. Why, is there thing, why are things like this? And then I'd go like, well, why am I saying that? But he understands that. His Holy Spirit ministers to you through that, encourages you. And when his timing is right, not ours, the rescue comes. And it's so much better when his rescue comes than my rescue. But the thing is, along the way, fascinating things happened in my heart, in the kingdom, in front of my eyes. If I would have chased a dollar, I would have missed it. I would have missed it. I got the opportunity to lead my wife to Christ at the altar. <clears throat> Watch her and my son get baptized. See people get delivered radically. See people walk in the doors just a wreck, barely living. Anxiety riddled, pain stricken, fear gripping them, no idea who they are, never lived sober, and be able to love that person and guide them and watch them grow and see their family, see them for the first time, see the joy in their wife and their kids when they visit. What? Money? Come on. The only thing that matters is kingdom work. That's the only thing that matters is kingdom work. You can't take money with you. If the money we chase isn't for kingdom work, then it's a waste. I've learned we can chase God, but we can't chase money. See, it's okay to be wealthy. It's okay to be a business owner. It's okay to have finance. It's okay to have a nest egg. All those things are great if you can do that while still putting God first. And if you could, I know many people that have an abundance of wealth that I've met since my time, and many donors, many people that I've sat down with that have the heart that's right for God, that God would trust them to put that in their hands. And I, he, has spoke, he has taught me through them, through their giving, through their heart, through how they manage that. See, the real truth I had to accept was I wasn't ready for any more than I had. Mm. 
That's the deep, real truth when I look within. Stop looking at my problems and whining and look up. I realized that through, through many times on my knees, through prayer, it's like, I, when I realized that, I didn't even want to say it to myself because I was like, Ugh. Ugh. and then I came to grips with it and it was like, I'm not ready for it. If I, wa- I feel like I am, but I'm not. If I was, you would have put it in my hands. You certainly won't deprive your children of what they need. And we always had what we needed. That was the truth that I personally realized in my life. I wasn't ready at that time for more. Even little things like getting a motorcycle totally consumed my mind for a little while. I mean, I, it was a, just a little thing, but it was like, whoosh. all I could think about was riding for the whole summer. I actually remember riding on that bike one night, feeling about, a, a lo- about as alone and empty as you could be, riding home, and I was kind of like, I haven't been home much at all. I was like, this isn't even as fun anymore. If you know me, how much I love riding and how much I love my bike, that's quite a statement. The Lord allowed me to get to this place where I was like, man, I'm, I'm doing it, ain't I? I should be enjoying this but not making it number one. That little thing was around that time I realized I wasn't ready. If I was ready for more, he would have put it in my hands. Most of us, our real struggle is not that we don't trust God. It's that we don't want what God has for us. We want what we want and God. See, we do, we do, we do, and I know I'm not alone in that. We do. We want to serve God. We love God, but we're like, hey, we got to make a living. Now I've had these things I wanted my whole life. Well, just like me, your life doesn't belong to you. If you gave it to Christ, it belongs to Him. Right? It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. If we say that statement and we mean it and it's true, then that means we would die to self in the, the moments where the Lord is calling us to do something different. I mean, what about you today? Maybe the worship team could come and help with a little closing worship, something soft, quiet. They left. The Lord knew that too. Do we need that? Probably not. So what about you today? What are your worries? What are your cares? Where's your heart? Is it totally committed to the Lord? Or is it divided? Hallelujah. Without music anyway, we will give an opportunity to come to the altar and have your own moment. Or maybe there's something background we can put back there. I don't know, but some of my best times were without anything. Sometimes we don't need that. But maybe there's some today who just want to have a moment to Say, you know what, let me get my let me get my sights realigned on you. Yeah. You know what, I have been feeling pulled to do this ministry and you know, I've just been more concerned about this. Yeah. Maybe some are serving. I know I was serving for years and the Lord would call me to serve more and I'd go like more? I remember doing eighty hours a week and the Lord saying more and I was just like, What do you mean more? I got to Yeah, more. Maybe that's somebody else today. Or maybe my brothers can relate to the message and need to lay something down today. What an opportunity that we that we have. The presence of the Lord is here. If you feel like music makes it not or makes it so, you might be missing that. The presence of the Lord is here. Take advantage. Take advantage of the time that you have at the altar. We'll just take a few minutes and then we'll end. Thank you, guys.
Thank you, Brother Hector. You know, as you're saying that, we cannot serve two masters. I think about the Apostle Paul, and I think it's in Philippians. He gives a list of his accomplishments. He had quite a pedigree. But you know what he said? I consider it all rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, uh, my Lord. And so, um, you know, we don't certainly have to get to the point where we perhaps are in danger of losing everything or our lives, and some of us maybe have at some point got to that. But we can serve our Lord and Master Jesus Christ right now where we're at, whether or not we're new or we've been serving him uh, for many, many years. That calling is the same for all of us. That calling is the same for all of us. So um, we have a few online announcements that I'm going to give. Um, then we'll close in prayer, and then we'll have some offline uh, things that I want to share. Um, Pastor Kevin wanted to remind us of a couple of things that are coming up this week. Um, we have our, our first coffee house um, ministry night this Friday from 6 to 9. Um, children under, or young adults, I guess, under 16 must be accompanied by an adult. And Chris, not to put you on the spot, brother, but I know you've sort of had your hands in that. Is there anything you want to share about that particularly? Okay. Um, and next Sunday is our first community intercessory prayer night. And that's where we're reaching out to all the, the churches in the Upper Valley. And um, so we need prayer. This community needs prayer. And so our first uh, community prayer night is, is next Friday. Um, we do have Bible uh, study um, tonight at 6 o'clock with, with Brother Dan. And there will be somebody here at 5 for intercessory prayer. So if you want to come out uh, an hour early, um, that's, that's fine. Um, again, uh, we are to pray without ceasing. Um, Lord Jesus, uh, what, a, what a message that, that you gave uh, Brother Hector and, and how you moved through all of these men, Lord God. And I pray, Father God, Lord, that uh, we have learned something. And, Father God, if we knew it, that it will be strengthened through the power of your Holy Spirit. And, Father, I, I pray your abundant blessings on this ministry. Father God, I know you will give them what they need and when they need it, Father God. And I pray against anxiety and worry for the ministry and for that which can come into any man or woman's life. It just goes to show that your truth transcends our worry. And we stand on the word of God. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.